Gemacast listeners, Hover would love to find a domain name for your passion. They'll automatically take 10% off your first order at the checkout using promo code JOMOCAST. My name is Christina Crook, and I am the author of The Joy of Missing Out. I want to welcome you to the JOMOCAST, a brand new podcast for founders and creators seeking joy in a digital age. JOMO is the joy of missing out on the right things, life-taking things like toxic hustle, comparison, disconnection, and digital drain in order to make space for life-giving commitments that bring us peace, love, meaning, and joy. If you're old enough to remember the birth of the internet as we know it, you probably remember the unbridled optimism that accompanied the digital revolution. There was no question that the web was all benefit. We'd be more productive, more efficient, better educated, better entertained, better connected. We wouldn't have to miss a thing. Tiffany Schlein remembers. She remembers how the birth of the smartphone made always-on living a constant. The founder of the Webby Awards, celebrating the best the internet has to offer humanity, Tiffany has also seen the costs. A generation of children less active, less healthy, less emotionally aware, and the beauty of life in general, subject to disruption at a moment's notice by the next push notification. Tiffany and her husband, Ken, a robotics professor at the University of California, Berkeley, adapted the ancient Jewish practice of the Shabbat, the divinely mandated day of rest to become the technology Shabbat, where her family, including their two daughters, forgoes all devices from sundown every Friday to sundown each Saturday. The tradition has become beloved and eagerly anticipated by the entire family, who refer to it as a vacation and celebrate the peace and expansion of conscious, lived time. Tiffany shares this practice in her new book, 24-6, The Power of Unplugging One Day a Week. It's a practice I've held in my own life and one I strongly recommend you try. Tiffany has also written and directed over two dozen long and short films and can be found on every social media channel, so she's far from turned her back on technology. She describes herself as a conversation maker and recognizes the power of technology to convey ideas in creative ways, to amplify but also in some cases amputate our humanity. I recorded this interview with Tiffany the week before her book release in the early, early hours of the morning. She spoke to me from her back garden. A garbage truck makes an appearance. This is real life. Just a heads up, we had a few audio gremlins in the recorder this week, mainly affecting my side of the call. It's a great conversation with Tiffany, though. She has such a unique perspective as a founder, creator, and parent. And I hope you enjoy our conversation about the power of unplugging one day a week. What I'd love to give you a chance to do is, um, you know, you hear the incredible thread of accomplishments that you've done over the course of your career all the time. But if you were in your own words to describe what you do, how would you describe it? It's interesting. I mean, everything from the Webby Awards, which really honored the, you know, the web in its early days to my films, which ultimately are about starting conversations and creating something, a powerful experience in a a focused dark theater (laughs) where people can really concentrate on the message and then hopefully it'll spark a bigger conversation for them and in society. So um, I think if you saw a core to my work, it would be to wrestle with um, ideas around making things happen and technology. What does it amplify and what does it amputate? And really... I think that's a thread in all of my work since the early days um, of the Webby Awards. I was just looking back at an old program I did like, oh gosh, over 20 years ago. And that was a question I asked. And I still think I'm asking that question in different ways. Um, but I love to bring people together in in new and exciting ways and share ideas. That was a really long answer. But, you know, it just, it's not like there's one thing. I love... Um, the transfer of ideas in creative ways and to bring people together to think deeply about something and ultimately, hopefully, 
to evolve the, their thinking or the way they do things. I've heard you describe yourself and you did that just now as a conversation maker, you know, instead of as a filmmaker. And I just love that idea. And I think a lot of people will resonate with that idea. I think um, with the advent of the internet in particular, that we often can feel like we're reduced to our bio, you know, we're reduced to the, you know, the Twitter description that we give to ourselves. And I love what one of the things I love about your work is that it's very, it's, it's not reductive. It's it, it, you are always opening up spaces to explore more ideas and more intersections. And that's part of what I'm really excited about talking with you about today. Um, but of course, you've got your brand new book, 24 six, the power of unplugging one day a week coming out um, in the very near future. And I want to tie that into another initiative that you're doing called character day. How many years has character day been running now? It's the sixth year. Um, and, you know, we look at the kind of neuroscience and social science of character development. And this year, the focus is w- your character and how you behave in your screen use. And when does being on screens enhance your character strengths like empathy and curiosity and creativity? And when does it diminish them? So it's really exciting because it's really merging two areas of interest for me right now um, with this practice I've done for a decade with my family of turning off screens one day a week and how much that's made our lives better um, and intertwining it with thinking about our behavior. I mean, that's really, I feel like what your work does too, is that how does that device influence your behavior and when does putting it away make your life better? I just love the two questions um, that you're asking around character day this year, of course, tied in also with with your book, 24-6, the two questions being, when and how does technology enhance our character? And when and how does turning off the screens develop our character? Um, But before we get really deep into that, I wanted to introduce people a little bit to your book. I had the privilege of of having an an early copy in preparation for this interview, and I wanted to read a quote where you write, A weekly day without screens improves our family's lives. Our daughters, Odessa and Bluma, the most gorgeous names, have done this practice most of their lives, and it's shaped how they interact with technology in extremely beneficial ways. They enjoy their time off screens and look forward to it. It feels like a vacation every week. We look forward to it with the same anticipation, and it provides the same feeling of deep relaxation we get when we go away. And because it expands your sense of time, It makes your day off feel like two days in one. And I wanted to read that. And that's the end of the quote. And I wanted to to sort of start our conversation there because I think that there's this idea that people have a fear of disconnecting from technology because they're worried that they're losing time. But this concept of expanding time, I had that same experience when I unplugged from the internet for 31 days. It was almost like, exactly as you described it, that time expanded, that I had more of it. it. It just, the days felt so much longer. And so I wondered if you could speak to that experience a little bit. Yeah, it's just, it blows my mind because still after doing it for a decade, my husband and I still marvel at it because it's such a different kind of feeling and sense of time where we, we will like, have done so many things. And then we'll look at each other. What time is it? Oh, and of course, we're not looking at our phone. We're looking at the clock on the wall. Oh my gosh, it's only nine in the morning. <laughs> but I I, really, I think a lot about um, Einstein's theory of relativity, because what he's saying is that time is relative to your state of motion. And what technology does is it speeds up your state of motion, what you can do, the, all the speed at which information's coming at you. And you're just moving so quickly that time goes by so fast. Your perception of time is that it's just, where did that hour go? You're just staring at your phone, scrolling at something mindless, and you just wasted an hour. Versus when it's gone from that, time feels just luxurious and very vacation-like. That's the only way I can describe it. But, you know, if you think about what's the one day you want to feel long. It's your Saturday when you're, you know, with your families, or if you don't have kids, just hanging out with your friends or by yourself, like you want that day to feel long. So it's like, it's literally like we are slowing down time every week. Like there's a remote control. We turn off the screens and it turns on this beautiful day of our life. That's extra long. And even, um, 
a lot of people are curious about our kids. And, you know, we have a teenager who's 16 and she's in her junior year of high school, which is a really intense year, as we all know, Um, at least in America. That's the big year preparing for college. And we were lying on the floor, (laughs) staring at the ceiling, hanging out uh, two weeks ago. And it was after her first week of school, which was very stressful. And she was like, I'm so glad I have this day. I mean, it just she couldn't do her homework and she has so much homework right now. She can't. And she couldn't post or like, or, you know, we were just hanging out and it was so great. <laughs> we sleep so well. That's the other thing. I have problems sleeping, especially at my age right now. Um, I'm 49. And so like my body's changing and I'm not sleeping as well. And I just sleep the best on Friday night. I, cause I just, there's no screen to near me, to wake me up, to stress me out, to glow at me, whatever it's going to buzz and tweet, whatever it, it's going to do to affect my behavior and my mood, which it does all the time, which I go into the book too, the other six days of the week, some kind of strategies around that. But I sleep so well Friday night and Saturday night. I just, those are my best nights of the week of sleep. I first discovered you um, actually through the National Day of Unplugging. Uh, which you've been a really important advocate for in terms of, you know, taking this an annual day a week, but ultimately um, your, your passion being to move people to a day a week. And, um, you know, I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I imagine that you're someone that might self-describe as very online. Would that be true? Yes, that would be true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I'm proud of. No, no, no. I mean, listen, I love tech. I'm not, I think that's really what I'm wrestling and I want to wrestle with everyone. There's so many amazing things. I mean, you and I met over Twitter on a DM on Twitter. Like, how beautiful is that? I mean, two like-minded souls have a common interest. We DM each other on Twitter. Now we've had multiple great conversations. I, we're having this conversation here that you can share with your community. I mean, how wonderful. So I love technology, just not all the time. And I think the pendulum has swung way too far. And if my early career founding the Webby Awards was all about, oh my God, the web is going to change the world. It's going to connect all these people in new ways and connect ideas. And now I'm kind of like, but not all the time. (laughs) Whoa, that got out of hand. (laughs) And let's look at our behavior. When is it good? When is it bad? Both personally for relationships and our democracy. I mean, we're being very manipulated right now um, with with companies and outside forces that want to manipulate us, either through selling us things or manipulating how we vote or how we do things. And we need to be much more aware of how it all works, Mm -hmm. how it's being worked on us and what we need to reclaim and take back. And I, I think those one day off a week of screens every week really gives me the detachment is very good on that level too. Cause I get to, have the perspective I don't think you can have when you're just in it sucked in and being addicted and on your device all the time. I have a couple of thoughts. So, I mean, a lot of us have probably heard or considered the idea that, you know, technology is a good servant, but a terrible master. And that ties into a couple of other quotes that I pulled out uh, reading 24-6, one of them being, quote, ultimately turning off screens and disconnecting from the online network weekly helps us use tech in a way that prevents tech from using us. And one more one more idea from you, quote, having one day off each week shocks you anew into the realization of how bizarre it is that everyone is head down looking at screens all the time. That should never feel normal. Oh, I mean, just walk down any street in a city and it's, it is, it's very disturbing. It's like a futuristic horror movie, really, that everyone's just staring down. Everyone. I mean, I was in New York at the High Line, which is this gorgeous railroad turned into a park. And there was this moment on a beautiful day where everyone was looking down. And I I just, you know, there's some moments where you feel like you do need to take kind of society by the shoulders and go, what are we doing? <laughs> and, you know, we're making some films, short films that go with the book. Um, And one of them is called Dear Fellow Human. And I do use that imagery. Um, It's just two minutes long. But I, I, I think with the book and character day and the films and, you know, I'm trying to let let's talk about it. When is it good? When is it not good? It's not good all the time. And I think anyone I talk to will say to me that they feel like they're on their screens too much doesn't matter what age they are. 
where they're from. I don't, there's not one person because I travel a lot giving talks. Is that getting too noisy behind? <laughs> there's like a garbage truck. I actually think it'd be really great. I love actually setting the scene. So where are we talking to you from right now? What are we hearing? So I'm like less than two weeks from book launch. And so I'm getting up very early and my whole family is sleeping and I'm trying to be respectful of that. So I'm out in the backyard in the dark with my laptop and now the garbage truck is going by, but that's the real life of like a working mom or a working parent. hundred percent. Um, so yeah, let's have that as background ambience because that's real and that's, I'm in my bathrobe. That's another visual that I, I'm glad you don't have video on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate you being candid enough to, sh- to set the scene for us. I think that just like, you know, with it, so much of the online space can be smokes and mirrors and a lot of, the, you know, the loneliness and also depression that people feel is, you know, having this glossy rose colored glasses view that everyone else's lives look way more sexy. <laughs> Yeah, I think in the book, I mean, I, I'm very honest in the book about, you know, and and things that didn't work that we tried. I mean, do something for 10 years. It's been a lot of um, things we've learned, like how to prepare for a technology Shabbat, how to prepare for it, how to let others know, how to know, let people you work with know. Um, but ultimately, it's very simple prep for the, what it gives you back because it gives you back so much more. People are looking there. There's so many mental health issues around people scrolling on social media, which, like you said, makes people feel bad about their own lives. And um, that's never a good thing. I think that all the youth today, um, you know, just amplifies and exacerbates insecurities that are already there. And I think really, like you said, um, just the thought that perhaps somebody's living a better life and everyone's human and we all have good days and bad. actually every day has good moments and bad moments <laughs> and um, that's real and I think what I'm trying to put forth here is something that's really been transformative that is this and again it's the weekly practice of it that's very powerful to me and I'm all for you know we just did a, a family vacation of a week where there was no wi-fi and it was like 50 families at this place and it was amazing. And that was great. Like, I will definitely do it again. Everyone had such a good time and it was such a different experience. But to me, and I, as I've gone deep and wide into Shabbat, and I am Jewish, but I'm not a religious person. And But I've loved learning about the wisdom of this over 3,000 year old practice. Because when something goes on for that long, there's a reason for it. And I know that you've also shared with me a practice that you do daily to kind of frame your day and end it. And I think we need to bring more ritual back into our lives. Like basically work and pleasure has been so blurred with these devices that there's no more weekends anymore. You're whenever you go in, there's such a mix of news and social and personal. It's just all mushed together and there's no space to just be. And as you wrote in your book, too, we need to create these spaces where we can just be with ourselves or our family without the whole world coming at us. Absolutely. I There's a lot to talk about there. I want to talk about how your journey into discovering Shabbat, because, you know, presumably I shouldn't presume, but did you grow up Jewish? Did you grow up, you know, with some of those practices? No, I did not grow up with Shabbat. I would call myself a cultural Jew, which means I, we, you know, I love Jewish, you know, the, the bigger rituals of like Hanukkah and the high holidays and comedy and Jewish food and the history of our ancestors and the focus on study and wrestling with ideas. I mean, there's so much that I love about it, but I'm not a religious person. It's never how I've tapped in and my family was, and I never grew up with Shabbat. So I feel like I've discovered this gift from my ancestors that is being I'm with my husband, Ken, and our daughters are just thinking about it in a modern era. Um, Because if you're an Orthodox Jew, I mean, I used to only think that you did a full day off if you were an Orthodox Jew. And Orthodox, they don't drive, they don't write, they don't use electricity. It's these rules that are very old. And I have great respect for whoever follows a practice like that. And then, of course, there's Christian versions of the Sabbath. Muslims have a day of prayer and rest. I mean, every culture used to have it really embedded. And now it's usually just the very observant who do it. And I'm kind of saying in this book, hey, let's let's engage with this ritual and make it work for you. Because if you don't have, like, just like I do yoga and meditation, but I'm not, I would not say I'm Hindu or Buddhist, but I think people can do a tech Shabbat 
wherever they come from. It's a beautiful practice that can make your life better. And I, I really try to unpack it in a way that both Jews that don't practice it, which is the majority of Jews in my life, should try to engage with it a full day off every week. And for those that aren't, um, this is a beautiful practice that's available to everyone that will really bring meaning and purpose and a sense of balance back to their lives. I'd like to bring listeners into the experience of how you discovered the practice of Shabbat by way of Ken. Is that okay if I share a little bit more from the book? Yeah. Awesome. So in the book, Tiffany writes, quote, it's sort of ironic by doing nothing, you accomplish more. Ken, her husband, discovered this when he was in his early 20s. In his words, quote, I started using Shabbat as a form of self-defense during graduate school. I spent six months in Israel where Shabbat is the law. No buses, no movies, no shops, nothing to do. So I made the best of it. I read poetry and philosophy. I painted. I listened to my cassette player. I wrote in my journal. I walked and I stared at the sky and daydreamed. I loved it. After a few weeks, I started to look forward to these Saturdays. So Ken had this powerful experience around Shabbat. Can you tell us a bit about how encountering his experience drew you into a desire for that same kind of practice? Yeah, I'm so glad you read that passage because I, I learned so much about it from Ken. But so when I met him, uh, you know, he had just become a you know tenured professor at UC Berkeley and in robotics. Is that correct? Yeah, robotics. So obviously, we're both steeped in tech. And I think I said something about Saturday. He's like, oh, I don't work on Saturdays. It's Shabbat. And I just looked at him like I'm a Jew, too. And I just I was like, really? And I just thought actually, I thought it was very sexy. <laughs> that he had such a boundary. It's such a clear boundary. And now this is mindful before smartphones. So I met him in 97. But I just thought, oh, that's so cool. And and we we did that pretty much. And then the smartphone came out. And that was in 2007. At that point, you know, we were married. We had our first daughter. And, um, you know, as anyone can remember how the smartphone changed everything, because suddenly you had this online world in your pocket any moment. So it wasn't like a device, even a laptop or computer. You could just bring it anywhere. And then people did and we all got addicted. So the Shabbats really started getting very slippery and work started infiltrating everything when smartphone came out. So, you know, we still did Shabbat dinners. You know, he grew up with Shabbat dinner, which is a beautiful meal Friday night. You invite friends and family. You, we make fresh bread. We it's like set the table fancy. It's fabulous. And so our tech Shabbats always start with a Shabbat meal with friends. So we had always kind of done that. And then partial days time off on Saturday. But then the smartphone really changed things. So then um, in 2009, I had this very dramatic uh, two week period where my father died and our second daughter was born. And it was just, I, you know, to have those two kind of events happen in the same period. And I just like literally life was grabbing me by the shoulders and saying, focus on what's important because we only have a short time here on this earth and you better be doing being present with those that you love. That's what it felt like. And so shortly after that, you know, I'm part of the organization that did the first National Day of Unplugging and they asked Ken and I to write a poem for it. And we did it that first year and it was the ceremonial one day a year or two, no screens. And we did it that time and we never stopped. We were like, oh my gosh, we need this in our lives. And we called it our tech Shabbats and we just never stopped doing it. And that, you know, and then now I've gone so deep and wide on the history of Shabbat and the ideas of it and talked to a lot of rabbis because, you know, I am very clear where I'm coming from, that I'm not practicing it in like an observant way of, but in my, in my modern interpretation, a day of rest, which is in the Bible, it's in the creation story, one day of rest. And in the 21st century, the day of rest to me and Ken means no screens because that is connected to so much stress and work. So the rule, you know, so, and we think everyone could benefit <laughs> I mean, I don't want to push anything on people, but I just, it's like, when you do something and it's so great, you're like, you got to try this. That's the way I feel right now. And then plus seeing everyone staring at their phones all the time and no one doesn't feel like they're not addicted to their phone. If they, if they aren't saying that, I would say they're being dishonest. That's kind of my perspective. Right. And I'm sure when your book, I mean, there was like this period of everyone became addicted and there was a period of like really acknowledging that we're addicted. And now I hope we're at this new phase of, okay, okay, what are we going to do about it? 
what are practices and things that we can be aware of and bring into our lives to use it when it's good and not use it all the time and be aware how other companies and people are using us through these devices. And like, those are all important conversations. And we're making this series of short films that we'll be releasing that any of your listeners, if they, you know, if they go to 246sixlife.com, they can sign up to find out, out about these challenges we're doing in character day in the films. But um, we're releasing these four films and one's called Dear Parent. It's just two minutes long. And then we're doing one Dear Student, then Dear CEO, Dear Legislature, and then Dear Fellow Human. And they're all going to be addressing this issue from those different lenses. This episode is brought to you by Hover.com. Everyone's got their thing. My thing is the joy of missing out and Hover's is the joy of free domain registration privacy. Hover is an incredible company actually based here in Canada, which is where I live. And I use Hover for all of my domain registration and I have for years and years. I'm thrilled that they are here on board with the JomoCast in the very first season. And as a listener, you can go to hover.com forward slash JomoCast to get your next great idea registered in a domain at Hover. So thank you to Hover for sponsoring season one of the JomoCast. One of the things that you touched on about the importance of taking a break every week is this idea of stress and, you know, the the perpetually on hustle driven culture that we've created and that the internet in particular has perpetuated. And what came to mind for me when you're talking about stress was also this idea that I've been thinking a lot about, which is the exhaustion people feel in terms of presentation of self, like public and personal persona and putting yourself out there all the time. And I think one of the power, like one of the other powerful pieces of unplugging a day a week is not only the simplicity of it, like it's just the parameters are ultra clear, which is why I absolutely love this concept. It's also that you take a day a week and remember that you are not the center of the universe, (laughs) that the world keeps turning without you. And that's not a negative thing. It's actually an incredibly, in my perspective, a really positive thing. And that you get a break from, from this presentation of self, this public persona that you feel you need to put forward all the time. Yes. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm in preparing for my book launch. So I'm out there much more than I feel that feels normal. (laughs) So I, yeah, every week I'm so relieved also to just be lying on the floor with my daughter or hanging out around the table with my friends and family. Being Tiffany. Yeah. I mean, there's pros and cons to both. I mean, I love also launching a film on, you know, sending it out online and responding and kind of getting it out on the channels. That's exciting too. But I think, yeah, it is exhausting to keep it all up. And that's why we need this break. And then I feel, you know, so refreshed afterwards. And I think, and the whole world does exist. Like so many people go, well, what would I do? You know, what if people need to get in touch with me? And what would I say? You know, and you know what, everyone, first of all, it's good to take a day where you're not available to everyone, even with my family and friends. I feel like it replenishes me to have a day. I mean, we have a landline if people need to reach us, but that's it's really not my day to be connecting with the outside world uh, or, or even family and friends. And I'm talking to them all the time during the week, right? So I'm a very communicative social person, but I like this one day I'm an introvert and um, I think it's powerful. I feel very replenished from that. I was thrilled that you talked a bit about Sherry Turkle's work and your and your book of, of course, always so important to go back to a lot of Sherry's earlier work and referencing, you know, Alone Together and all these things. Um, but the idea around Sherry Turkle's work that I wanted to chat with you about is just the quality of our time together. So instead of like focusing on the removal of technology, you know, bringing in this conversation around the quality of our time together and Sherry Turkle will, will write about and speak about, you know, being physically present but emotionally and mentally absent to the people around us. I'm wondering how important that concept was for you in the writing of the book and also um, in terms of this conversation you want to have with Character Day this year. Sherry's great. And I I love um, all the work that she's done around this issue. Um, And, you know, I think the physically present part is really important. Like we don't allow phones on the table 
when we're eating around the table as a family, certainly not for our tech Shabbat dinners, and and recently at the office, because the, all the research I discovered in the book about just seeing a phone off on a table will make you that much less present. So now, I mean, besides the fact if they're buzzing and beeping, even if they're on silent, it's so distracting and it takes you out of flow. When you get d- distracted by a, a text or a buzz, it takes you out of flow for 23 minutes to refocus. So knowing all of that, I asked people to put their phones in their bags and check them when they go to the bathroom because it was just, you know, it was like a buzzing orchestra at my office at a certain point. But the being present part, there's one stat in the book that parents are with their kids more than they've ever been, but they're not present with their kids as much, you know. So I think, um, but Sherry, listen, I, I try to reference all of the great thinkers on this subject that I have great respect for. I've known for a long time, um, like even Douglas Rushkoff, Jaron Lanier, you know, what they've all had great ideas. And I think I think where I'm coming in is um, showing the whole space of ideas and then also this very specific practice, which I feel like really creates the space for that being present. And, you know, a full day every week, it's like it feels so abundant. That presence feels abundant that day. And, you know, oh, there was one point you made that I really want to go back to because we're doing these mini challenges with people right now. So basically, if you sign up for my email list and you can start this at any point, if your listeners, even if you miss the period, we're going to kind of have it on our site. So everyone can do this kind of eight weeks of mini challenges and then four weeks of a tech Shabbat. Cause to me, again, it's about the ritual of the weekliness. And so like last week we asked people to not look at their phone when they woke up or when they went to sleep for 30 minutes and not at meals or 15 minutes, whatever you can do, but just don't let that frame your day. And I actually think that's, Heart, and then this week it's go for a walk without your phone for 30 minutes or do something without your phone. I actually think that's harder than the tech Shabbat, and I'll tell you why because it's much more slippery. Because you're working, you're using your phone to do your schedule, to coordinate, to work, it's just it's harder to put it away. Whereas this very strict boundary of a tech Shabbat, there's like no squishiness, they're just away. You don't look at it, you're not, you know. It's not a presence. I mean, the one thing I'll say is, Ken, <laughs> there's a Jewish term for Orthodox Jews who, if they really need something done, they have a Shabbos goy. And that's somebody like turn on the stove for them. Ken is ultimately the family Shabbos goy because if we're really lost and we have to look up GPS, <laughs> he'll have it in his pocket just in case. But it's very funny because I know I can't even handle that. I don't even want to look at it. I don't want it to be near me. It's like put away. And actually, I just find that much easier. It's like, oh, from sundown, you know, from Friday night, Saturday night, it's just not a part of my life. And I love that constraint. And I feel freedom from that constraint. If it was like the little, like I said, the little mini challenges uh, are harder. So every morning, I don't look at my phone first thing. And I've done that for the last two years. That's like a new practice I've instituted. I journal in this five minute journal, which I believe I've told you about. Mm -hmm. I use, I use the same. Right. You told me your wonderful practice. And I love this practice. I love looking back on it. It's like, what are the three things you're grateful? What would make today great? And then at the end of the day, what three amazing things happen? And they're often very different than what you thought they were going to be. And it's called the five minute journal. And I love it. And I write about it in the book too. But there are still mornings where I'm like, go to reach for the phone because it's how I wake up, even though I keep it on airplane mode. And I just still have that wrestle. And I go, go to the journal, go to the journal. (laughs) So I I don't want to, I don't want to project like I have it all figured out. Like I have the day I have figured out. That's amazing. The other six days, I'm trying lots of different strategies to um, bring more balance back into my family and for me personally. But that that's a harder, that's a harder thing to do. I 100% agree with you. And if you were in the room with me and for listeners, um, I'm just nodding madly over here <laughs> in from my office because I, when I unplugged for 31 days, people ask, oh, you know, was it so hard? Was it so hard? Honestly, it was so easy because the parameters were so clear. It just was off the table. Whereas Every day since then has been so much more difficult because you're negotiating and renegotiating and renegotiating things day after day. And like the little challenges and I've done, and I've done similar things with my community where I used to have daily Jomo and it was like these little playful quests to get off your screens and people see, you know, found value in them. But ultimately, right. Having the, having those parameters ultra clear, like you're saying with the technology Shabbat, I think is the single most impactful thing that you can do around your tech, your screen use. 
hands down. I mean, and when you said the word negotiate, I'm like nodding because then we haven't even talked about the negotiating with your kids. Because during the week, I just feel like I'm in a court on screen time. <laughs> like, okay, do your homework. Okay, you get, you know, they, my youngest, our youngest gets 30 minutes a day, um, work school days after homework. But, you know, if, if she's making a movie, does that count? And if she, you know, she's doing something creative, it, you know, and it's like this constant negotiation. It's exhausting. I mean, do you feel that way? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And then you, and then you add in the element of two partners in the family, you know, two parents, then they also have different approaches. Yeah. So it's like they're having a multi negotiation every day about this thing that's so captivating and alluring that it's hard for everyone to get off it. So what is that? I mean, let's, let's look at that. That's what I'm hoping to do on the book tour is to go, okay, let's talk about that. You know, 10 years ago, uh, you know, this one stat that kids are outdoors 50% less than we were. And we know how good being outdoors is. And okay, so what kind of kids are we raising? And what kind of humans do we want to raise? And what do we think is good? And what do we need to weed out here? Absolutely. I think that that puts us right into the home stretch of our conversation today, which is a conversation I want to have with you about the impact on community. I know community is incredibly important to you. I, in my research in preparation for our conversation, I came across your declaration of interdependence. You know, these, all the ways in which our individual actions, our individual character, our individual choices impact the community around us. I want to have a conversation with you about that because I think a lot of the conversation around screen time is individually focused impact on self, self self-care, wellness. And then the other conversation I'm hearing is around productivity, which ultimately is about, you know, just financial ends for organizations and companies. But the conversation I want to have with you is about the impact on community. What is the impact on community of everyone doing what you were describing earlier around walking around or being on the high line, staring down at their devices? What is the impact on community? What is, what is the shift you want to see happen around screen use in regards to community? I want to make it not cool to be talking to someone and they're pulling out their phone scrolling. I mean, that, that never happened like seven years ago. Then it started happening five years ago. Now I would say that is commonplace. You're talking to someone, you bring something up that makes them look at their phone and then they start talking to you and scrolling. And even, you know, the little moments are what stitch the fabric of our society together. When you're talking to someone, when you're having a meal with them, I want to make it not cool again to have your phone on the table. Um, when you're at the, when you're at the library, when you're at the checkout stand, and I have this conversation with myself too. have a connection with the person you're talking to, like make eye contact. Don't look at the phone because we're all like multitasking working. I mean, not all of us, but we're any working parent can relate. You're coordinating so much, but just like take those little moments when you're walking, put it away. When you're talking to someone, really put it away. And when you're having a meal with someone, put it away and try to create what I love is like a whole day where you're not on it to see what that feels like, because it'll remind you what life used to be like. And I think on society, you know, what do we have but connecting? And when we're connecting so broadly online, the one line I have that I've used in kind of multiple films and, and in the book is, connecting broadly is meaningless unless we connect deeply and we're losing eye contact. We're not barely looking at people when we're talking to them and um, eye contact and the way that can encourage empathy and connection is so important. So just remind everyone how important that is for human relationships and community. I want to close with, um, we'll get to where people can reach you and how they can connect uh, to get the book and also character day in a moment. But I just have a little rapid fire round uh, for you. Just a few questions I want you to answer super quickly. Are you up for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had my coffee. Okay, Tiffany Shalane, what brings you most joy in your life? My tech Shabbats, (laughs) my family. (laughs) A great meal with family and friends for Shabbat and no screens for a day. That brings me the most joy. Amazing. Okay. What do you want less of in your life? Mm. So let me preface that by saying that I, the, the um, practice that you mentioned earlier that we chatted about previous to this interview is one where I ask myself at the end of each day, what today was most life-giving and what was most life-taking. And it's rooted in a centuries old contemplative practice 
called the examine, where you examine yourself at the end of each day, asking these questions. And that can also be, um, it's been (laughs) renamed and repackaged so many times. That's why I know it's stood the test of time and it's worth keeping just like the Shabbat. Um, But there's a new psychology matrix that calls it the towards or away matrix. And so it's like, what do I want more of? So that was the joy question. And then the question I'm asking you now is what do you want less of? What do you want less of in your life? I think what I would like less of is all of our leaders trying to move us into action through fear. And I'd rather more moving into action through higher ideals. Because I think um, where we are, at least in America right now, it's just such a fear, bullying driven society from our president. (laughs) So I just feel like... um, that's at the heartbeat right now of our country. And it's, I want less of that for sure. You know, the name of this podcast is the Jomo cast and I've creating a conversation. I know you're a conversation creator. I also hope to create conversations around the joy of missing out. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do with this movement is to focus on the joys we can step into um, away from our devices instead of being motivated by fear, the fear that we're going to miss out, the fear that we need to be always present, always connected online because we're going to miss out on something. And I am just so grateful for the ways in which you are teaching us in new ways and new practices to um, embody that in our lives. So thank you so much for being with us today. This is such, it was a joy to speak with you truly because I feel like we're so on the same page on this. And I love talking to people that are coming at things from maybe a slightly different way, but we're at the heart, we're talking about the same thing. And I just feel such a kindred spirit with you. I love that exam and practice. I, I'm get, I wish I can add that. You know, someday I'd like to create a journal and I would add that. What, dra- what gave you to you and what drained you is such a powerful way. You know, the one thing I'll add that's in the five minute journals, it says, what's one thing you wish you could have done differently today? And that's kind of coming from the growth mindset ideas that we talk about with Character Day, Carol Dweck's work of um, always learning. And I, you know, we're, we're all, as I said, we're always learning as humans and trying to be better and and evolve. So I love all the work you're putting out into the world with this podcast and your book and your challenges. And I look forward to more ways that we can work together. Me too. Wholeheartedly. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Where can people, um, well, obviously you said your book is available everywhere as of what is the release date? It's September 24th, but of course they can pre-order it if they hear it early. Um, Okay. Order it now. And uh, wait, you're in Canada. Correct. So I'm going to be on book tour in Canada because Indigo Books is going to be doing a whole bunch of things with the book. So definitely look on their site because I'm going to be in Toronto. I think it's the 21st and 22nd of October. Um, I'm also very active on Twitter. That's my preferred social media is just at Tiffany Schlain and there's no C in my last name. And then I'm on Facebook and Instagram, all those places. Um, But if you want to see my films uh, also, well, I guess I I would point people to just um, 246sixlife.com for everything having to do with book, the films I've made around this idea Character Day, you can just go to characterday.org to find out about all these challenges we're doing um, and, and to sign up for Character Day, which happens the week of publication. So September 27th, it's very fun. Um, and sign up for my newsletter because I do a quarterly newsletter called Breakfast at Tiffany's. Um, and all of the these challenges and the book stuff goes through that as well. I'm on that list and I, I love that it's quarterly and I always look forward to it. I'm going to go get dressed now. Have a beautiful day. Have a good day. Bye. Well, thank you for listening. You can learn more about our guests in the show notes and by visiting jomocast.com. The Jomocast is edited and produced by Thomas J. Inge, musician and composer by day, podcast ninja by night. Special thanks to writer Rebecca Wigand, musician Peter Katz, and educator Adam Kaplan for their practical and moral support creating this season of the podcast. The JomoCast is listener supported. When you sign up as a patron at patreon.com forward slash JomoCast, you'll get access to many bonus episodes with me and digital sociologist, Dr. Jess Piriam. Plus, we'll send you a Jomo Manifesto letterpress print, stickers, and a handwritten card in the mail because I believe in the power of the personal. Plus, snail mail is just one of the most joyful things on earth. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review it on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you subscribe. And a five-star spectacular. Do you want more JOMO? Go to experiencejomo.com to sign up for a free week of JOMO quests to get you started on your journey. As always, remember, there is joy missing out on the right things. I'm your host, Christina Crook. Thanks for listening.